Well, hello, campers. I'm here with another Q&A film. I uh, slowly am starting to build out my film on Albania, but it's going to be a while because I suck at filmmaking, which you should know by now, and it looks like there's some sort of horrendous insect inside the van. Speaking of that, we're going to touch on uh, 11 questions here today. Before we, we begin a little update, I'm still in Maine. <clears throat> I'm still in the van. I will probably be in the van for 90 days straight. Um, I do have access to a house, which you cannot see right here. So uh, I am inside. I have a computer set up in there to do the filmmaking stuff. Uh, but I do spend a lot of time in the van because uh, my wife's family and family members are in there. And, and sometimes, you know, you just need a place that you can lock yourself in away from other people. Also not thrilled with my uh, fitness at the moment. I spent obviously three weeks teaching in Albania. I didn't run a single time. I didn't ride my bike a single time. So I've been trying to get back in some semblance of shape here. I just did my second run since I've been here about four miles each time. Uh, the first time it was absolutely hellish. I thought I was going to die. Today felt great. I did about 33 miles on the bike yesterday, a couple of hours. Cycling here is a breeze. I would say a five mile ride in New Mexico at where I live is equivalent to about a 20 to 25 mile ride here. It's flat. Even when it's windy, it's not that big of a deal. Tons of air. There's more air here than I feel right even consuming. I never build up lactic acid in my legs. I can hammer as hard as I want. It's, um, it's interesting. It's, a, it's actually really fun. And the coastline here, as you can imagine, is absolutely gorgeous. But here I am again in the van. Product placement, huh? Just got full sponsorship. Just kidding. Okay, I'm one person with one opinion. My opinion rankle some people. That's just the way it's going to be. I appreciate you sending the questions in and um, I love doing these and I've mentioned this before, but these are pretty easy when I feel like I haven't done anything in a while. I can jump in and do a, a Q and a film and we go from there. So, uh, would, do you think my fitness issues have anything to do with the level of bourbon consumption that's been happening over the past couple of weeks? And then rocky consumption before that. I think there is a correlation there. Question number one, how is van life going and will you do a build film? The short, I'm going to answer the second question first and the answer is no. I am not going to do a van build film because it's basically irrelevant. I have not changed the van in three years basically. It is a kit from Wayfarer Vans out of Colorado Springs. It's very simple, very nominal, very basic and all installs and uninstalls with a single socket wrench. I can take out everything you see inside this van with a single socket wrench and I can turn it back into a cargo van if I want to do that. It's a very basic vehicle. I didn't want anything expensive or anything fancy. It is so practical and so much fun and I absolutely love this vehicle. It's probably my single favorite vehicle I've ever had. Uh, but there's no reason for me to do a van build. It's a Dodge ProMaster 1500. It is go to go to any plumbing shop in the country, and electricians, and you'll see a ProMaster. It's not a super sexy van. It's two by two. What else do you need to know? Just get one and use it to go into the world. Van life is going very well. I was built for this kind of thing. I've been doing kind of similar things my whole life, camping out of vehicles. So it's not a big stretch for me to do that. But there is a warning here for you. When someone sent that question in, I went to YouTube and I typed in van life, which has to be the biggest mistake I've made in my entire adult life. There are so many con artists and scammers out there, and that includes the overlanding, the living in the car, and the van life people. If you are having a life and death scenario three days a week in your van, you are a moron. These people are so shameless. They will do anything to get views. They will switch vans every three weeks. They will act like they were, they're, they're being terrorized. They will act like they got robbed when they didn't get robbed. They will put themselves, man, women, children, gender neutral, on, they will put themselves in thongs on the thumbnail for the film and then think we're gonna take them seriously. Same thing, I, it drives me crazy. Do not listen or watch these people because again, they will do anything for views. Van life is not that sexy. It's really not. I, I can't remember the last time I saw someone in a thong around my van. 
that would be something I should be able to remember and I can't do it. So if you see someone in a thong in a thumbnail, that's a fabricated identity reality to get views. If you see people claiming that they're having mental health issues because their van life is so rocky, that's a scam, chances are, as well. It's not sexy. You ever been to KOA? What else do you need to know? Boondocking, pooping in a bag. Yeah, that's what van life is. It's eating strange food. It's waking up in the middle of the night because you hear animals outside the van. It's not super sexy. So van life for me is awesome. I don't think it's for everyone. If your first question, and I mentioned this before, if your first question is where do you go to the bathroom, you probably don't want to go to van life because you're going to have to get creative and it's going to get dicey. It's going to get ugly. It's going to be a, you're going to be in the middle of a cockfight. So that's all I have to say about that. And I'm moving on. Question number two, can you talk about audio recorders? Is an iPhone okay and how to approach an audio interview? Great questions. Probably not the guy that you want specific data on, but I can tell you what I do and then you can take it and run with it. I started with a Zoom H1 audio recorder, which is the little Zoom. Now I think there's a Zoom H1N. It's fine, they're great, they're small, not that expensive, record great sound. There is a YouTube channel that I was going to post about, which I haven't done yet, which reminds me, and I will, on my site. I want to say it's called Free to Use Sounds, and I want to say it's a Dutch guy and an American woman, and they travel around the world recording sound, and they seem relatively normal, and they give great information, and the guy knows way more about recording sound than I ever will. So now I use a Zoom H6 for my audio recordings, and then I use a tiny Sony mic, which I don't know the number of it, but it's about this big. It's very small, fits in the palm of my hand. That's what I use in Albania. And I use binaural microphones, which means a mic goes in each one of your ears. It looks like headphones and records 3D ambient sound. Now, there's an upside and a downside to those. And that guy on the channel, again, will give you more information than you can possibly handle. And he, he does it really well. I think that channel is very well done. I'll put a link below if I remember. The binaurals pick up wind very easily, and they also pick up every kind of movement sound. So some of the new binaural mics have a little clip right here that goes on the back of your shirt to keep that the, the cable from touching you. It kind of goes around like an insect, like an insect antennas. Those are probably better. Um, and I used it most of the time in Albania. I used it without the binaural mics because I just didn't have time to get the binaural mics out and put them on. I was recording sound. It was like the... On a daily drop-down menu of tasks when I'm teaching, recording sound is probably seven, eight, nine on the list. So I should have recorded a lot more than I did, but I just didn't, you know, when I've got this other list of to-dos to do, I, I can't record sound. So an iPhone is totally fine. Whatever it is you use to record sound is absolutely fine. It's not like you're going to be recording this stuff and then selling it on a database somewhere. If you are, then you better step up your game. And if not, just record with whatever you have. It's totally fine. I mean, half the stuff I've posted on YouTube so far, it's kind of okay sound, but I wouldn't call it great top, top level, high quality sound by any stretch. Um, again, Zoom H1 or H1N, which is a new one. I use Zoom H6 for my audio interviews and I use a Sony with binaural mics in the field. In terms of an audio interview, there isn't really much to prepare for, but here's the beauty of audio compared to video and why I prefer to do audio interviews as opposed to video interviews. First of all, they're a hell of a lot less work. There's no editing the video. There's nothing like that. Audio interviews I can have online 20 minutes after I'm done with the interview. I do not edit my audio interviews and the people I'm interviewing know that going in. I think of maybe the hundred interviews I've done, there were one or two where people said, look, I really wish I hadn't said whatever. And I said, no worries, I'll go in and cut it out. But for the most part, everybody knows I don't edit. I want a conversation. I don't want an interview. The beauty of audio interviews is that the, the person that you're interviewing is not on camera. When you put people on camera, suddenly the third person in the interview is self is the other person understanding and realizing and remembering they have a self and it's on film. And everybody thinks about themselves in a certain way. I look good this way, I don't look good this way. They're concentrating on something besides the interview. When you do audio interviews only, 
you will get a level of focus and truthfulness that I often don't see in video interviews, simply because the person is not on camera. And that is what I want. I want honesty, truthfulness, humor, and focus. And that's what audio does. And that's why I do it. And they're, again, very simple. Are mine super high quality? Probably not. In fact, I did one that had a reggae station coming through the audio recorder and I couldn't hear it while during the recording. So there's that. Number three, can you talk about the 50 millimeter and how you finally quote, discovered how to use it? <clears throat> yeah, I think I talked about this before. This is my leg, by the way. So I bought a 50 way back in the day when I was a newspaper photographer. I think it was 1993. I was an intern at the Arizona Republic. I switched over to, from Nikon, at the time, I, everybody was shooting Nikon, for the most part, except a couple of F1, Nikon, uh, Canon F1 people. Most people are shooting Nikon. One guy at the paper had FM2s. Still, he was one of the best photographers. He was still using FM2s and manual lenses. Everybody else was like F3s, F4s, F5s, but the F4s came out, and the first generation of F4 was an absolute disaster. You could, they just broke all the time. You could not keep this camera out of the repair shop. And I had two of them. So I would go to shoot an assignment and like hit the shutter and it would just rip through the whole roll of film. Or it would like burst, something would burst on the side and like smoke would come out of it. They were junk. And so I was really stuck because I was shooting every single day for the paper. And it's not like you can go in and say, sorry, I don't have a camera that works. So I was scrounging for gear. And at this point, Canon comes out with autofocus. Everybody switches over. I would say 80% of the staff switches from Nikon to Canon. Two zooms, 2035, 7200, EOS 1s at the time, which was a great camera. The rewind was probably sounded like a like a the Concorde taking off. It was incredibly loud. They fixed that on the uh, EOS 1V. And so I switch from, from Nikon to Canon, but I switch a little bit late. So the market is completely flooded with camera gear. And at the time, the place that you did all of your exchanges was Glazer's camera up in Seattle. So I call the guy, literally on a landline. I call him and I'm like, take mercy on me. You know, I'm an intern at a paper. I've got two first gen F4s. I've got all these lenses. And he's like, you're screwed. Uh, yeah, we'll take all that stuff. But what you're going to get in return is an EOS A2E, which was a very bizarre camera, but one I liked quite a bit a motor, one zoom lens, which I think was a 20 to 35. And he's like, and that's all you get. That's like nothing. You get, you're taking this much Nikon and you're getting this much Canon. And I was like, I'll take it because at least it was a working camera and it was new. Hang on. I blew snot rockets all morning on the run and I'm, they're still coming up. It's a, it's a gold mine in there, people. So anyway, I get this thing and I think the guy felt bad for me. And he's like, look, I'll throw in a 50 mil. So I get a 51.4 Canon autofocus EOS lens. And I'm like, wow, this is amazing. It started to fall apart literally within about two days. The whole thing would just, the elements in the lens rattle, 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 rattle. I had to keep a screwdriver to keep the thing together. It was a piece of crap. I never liked it. I sold it. Some schmuck bought this thing. <laughs> Sucker. So anyway, but something in the back of my head, I'm using the 20 to 35. I eventually get enough money to get a 70 to 200. So I got the two zooms. I get a second body. I don't remember what it is. It could have been another A2E, but something in my head, I'm, there was something about the fixed lenses on Nikon because I had a 24, a 35, an 85, a 180. With my Nikon kit, it was all primes, fixed. And all of a sudden with Canon, I'm zooms. And I, there's something about the zooms I don't love. They're great for the newspaper, but for my own stuff and my personal projects, I felt it was lacking. And in the back of my head, I was like, man, that 50 prime, there was something about it. So I buy another one, but I don't really understand the 50. I'm, I'm using it, but it's, and the 50 is this bizarro distance that doesn't, it doesn't look sexy at first. It's not long enough like a 180 to compress anything to a dramatic extent. And it's not wide enough. You know, you slap a 24 on, the whole world looks great. You're just like looking around, you know, wow, look at my feet. They look amazing in the 24. My legs look like they're this long. The 50's in the middle, it's not sexy. The 50 is a blue collar workman. Gets up in the morning with his lunch pail, straps on his work boots, and goes into the coal mine. That's what the 50 mil is. So I sold it. Goes on, goes on. I might have bought and sold another one. And then I committed to Leica. I committed to shooting rangefinder Leicas, uh, two of them, three of them at times. Third is a backup, but most of the time, two Leicas, two lenses, 35, 50. 
I bought the 50 F2 Leica and for whatever reason, it just clicked. And I don't, it has something to do with the rangefinder and just looking through and seeing that white box and nothing else. Like the M4 Leica just has a white, there's no electric electronics in the camera. And the 50 on the Leica was a little different from 50 on other cameras. And I absolutely loved the chameleon aspects of the lens. You could shoot it wide open, get close, the fall off was beautiful. Or you could pull back, rack it to F5.6 or F8, and you could sort of have this weird high, high depth of field, middle distance lens that had a little bit of compression to it. And I was like, oh, that's what the 50 is. That's how you use the 50. It can be anything you want. It has never left my camera since then. I always have a 50. Uh, with the Fuji right now, I use the, the uh, Chinese uh, Zongyi Speedmaster 0.95 35 millimeter 50 equivalent. That is just glued on one camera body. I think it's an X-T2. I don't take it off. Um, I, I think I have, I have another 50. I have the 50 F2 Fuji autofocus one, which is great. It's super small, it's light, it's weather sealed, but it doesn't give me the look I want. So I give it to my wife. <laughs> Let her use it. She doesn't know. In Texas talk, she don't know no better. Um, and that's why I love the 50. So I can't imagine that going away anytime soon. I will just throw this out there. Everyone knows now I'm looking, looking at the Leica Q2. Here's the uncanny thing about the Leica Q2 is that I would say, and I'm not exaggerating, 95% of all the people I talk to that have one or had one or want one, want a 35. Nobody seems to want the 28 and yet there it is. And someone told me that, like I said, they're not making a 35. So my guess is it's a technical issue between that single lens mount, one seven aperture, something about the, the size of the sensor, the coverage, something in there is a technical thing that forces them to do a 28. Not the end of the world. Look, 28 millimeter, when I was at University of Texas at Austin in photojournalism school, wearing parachute pants, an IZOD shirt with a collar up and white high tops, I looked like a stud. I mean, I was a thoroughbred, a stud, a photo stud in that outfit. And my parachute pants were not skin tight like my friend Bobby's. Bobby was a drummer. He wore skin-tight parachute pants. He had a line of women a quarter mile long. And he, they would just walk up and he would give them the thumbs up or the thumbs down. Me, gweeb off to the side. My parachute pants are super baggy. Not cool. Not happening. Doesn't matter your size or shape. If your parachute pants are baggy, it's not good. But the school, for whatever reason, the school was mired in 1960s, 1970s ideology. They kind of taught students at the time. I don't know what it's like now. They, they don't, I have no communication with the school. I got a degree in photojournalism and worked for 30 years as a photographer and never once got communicated by the school I graduated from. That's kind of, it's gotta be some sort of record. I, th I feel kind of proud about that. I must have been a horrible student. The school kind of taught people that you were gonna get a 28 mil and a Nikon FM2 and you were gonna shoot black and white film and you were gonna be an artist and everyone was gonna love you. The problem was the industry shot color so I decided very early on, I need to go teach myself how to shoot transparency because I'm looking around at the magazine world, transparency. I'm looking at the newspaper world, transparency. I'm looking at fashion and commercial and advertising and everybody else, they're shooting transparency. So the school was like, you're, you're an elitist. You're, you're kind of a jerk that you wanna do this color stuff. And I'm like, not really. Now, eventually into the photo program, they did get to color and you had to shoot transparency. But I went out and I befriended the Austin Fire Department photographer, an amazing guy, just a gem of a guy who saw me with my police scanner in the middle of the night cruising these crime scenes on the east side of Austin. And he was like, I like that kid. That kid's morbid in the just the kind of way that I like to see in a kid. So he came up to me at a crime scene, it's a house fire, and he's like, hey, what are you doing? And we started talking. He goes, you know, I have a color lab at the fire department. He taught me how to shoot color and print color. So Irwin, thank you very much, because that put me far ahead. But 28 millimeter was like, it was the bell of the ball at that time. The school, when you checked out camera gear, 28 was like on everybody's camera for some reason. And I think I was fine with a 28. I shot 24 for at least 10 years in press photography because I had a 24 and like a 50 and an 85 and a 180. So 24, I could get used to the 28. Here's the thing for you out there with the cues, show me some work. I want to see 
real projects, like entire projects, not random street stuff. I want to see somebody's project shot entirely with a Leica Q. That's how I judge a camera system, not on random street stuff. No, 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 no. And oh, by the way, whatever you do for the love of God, do not under any circumstances go to YouTube and type street photography. Oh, Jesus Cristo, it's a minefield out there. That insect is looking not happy with Uncle Dan. All right, number four. This is a weird one. It's long and I don't know if there's a question here. <clears throat> I've started working on my first long-term or even one uh, any term photojournalistic project. The project will cover the hobby sport of airsoft. The project will most likely be split into three segments, portraits, gear, and game scenes. While I am pretty happy and confident about the photos I've taken already for the first two segments, the photos that I want to cover happens at such an airsoft match kind of miss the feelings. Okay, I want them to convey, I play airsoft, so maybe the comparing the feelings isn't what I actually see. Okay, let me paraphrase. What he's saying is he's starting this project. He plays airsoft. Airsoft, I think, is like a modified high-tech paintball, but it's not paintball. I think the weaponry and everything looks more authentic. It looks like real M4s and M16s or whatever the hell people are using now. And you shoot these little, I think it's a pellet of some kind. I don't know. It's like a, it's like a war game. Let's just throw it out there. I know the airsoft people are probably cringing right now. I'm not opposed to airsoft. I just don't know that much about it. And your images don't convey the level of conviction that you feel towards the game. Get used to it. So when you're in love with something and you're doing a photo project on it, it doesn't mean that anybody else is going to love it. And that's the part of photography that's gotten so skewed in social media and online world and the YouTube world, the vast majority of people in the world. Let me just, let me slow this down and repeat it for those of you out there who are multitasking. Stop multitasking. It's impossible, by the way, for the human brain to do two things at once. Just keep that in mind. The vast majority of people in the world, let's say, uh, yeah, the majority are looking for food, water, and shelter. They do not care about you or your photography and they never will. And that is perfectly fine. Because the only person who has to care about it is you, number one, because if you're focused and driven to do your airsoft project, then you will do the best airsoft project you possibly can, and you will put it in front of people, and some of those people will say, wow, what is airsoft? What is this? I've never seen this before. Some will be revolted and say, uh, you know, I cannot believe you're using these guns. I can't believe you're, you're, you're promoting this, blah, blah, blah. So you're going to get the whole mixed bag. I did a project on paintball once. Same thing happened. Oh, you guys are savages. I don't play paintball. I was photographing paintball and the anti-gun folks were still like vehemently in my face about how anybody could ever do something as horrible as playing paintball. Whatever, it doesn't matter. The other people that care are the people in your photographs. You have to do them justice. That is your responsibility. Their reaction is on you. And that doesn't say that you pander and you cater to them. You cannot do that. As a documentary photographer, you have to tell the story that you want to tell. You have to cover the story as accurately as humanly possible. And at times, you're going to break some eggs and people are going to get ticked. Trust me, been there. Why does it say tracking cancel? What's going on? It just, I didn't touch it. It just it seems like it's working. Uh, so that's it. You just have to keep going. Plug, 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 shoot, shoot, shoot. If you want to midterm report them, take some pictures back to the, to the people you're playing airsoft with, which is what I did with paintball. And they loved it. And the paintball guys started giving me ideas saying, hey, we should do this and we should do that. So it was fun. Uh, and don't worry about it. Take your time. Enjoy it. Have fun. Number five, can you talk about multiple exposures and how you figured out the technique? Desperation, quite a motivator, as they say. Yeah, so I mentioned this before, 2019, I went to Albania for the first time to take a workshop with Elena Dorfman. And I was like, Albania, I don't know anything about Albania. I'm an American, where is it, first of all? Um, that kind of thing. So I did some research on Albania and realized it was a very unique place with a unique history. And I kind of felt, and, and I'm not sure this is so accurate anymore. In fact, when I'm starting my Albania film, the dialogue that it starts with starts with is I lost my story. So what I'm about to tell you is not what I'm doing now. Again, improvise, adapt and overcome steal from the Marine Corps. That is a great, great philosophy when it comes to documentary work. So I go there 2019 and I'm thinking to myself, all right, well, there was a 50 year isolation, communist Albania, and now you have democratic 
emerging into the world Albania. That's kind of two stories parallel, so maybe this double exposure thing might work. And what I thought I would do is I would do one exposure and then slightly move the camera and do another one. But dumbass me didn't realize that if you do that, it basically just looks like you blew your focus and it's, and it's blurry. It's just slightly out of focus. And I was like, that sucks. I realized this morning one of the workshop wandering the streets of Tirana. And I was like, oh, uh, I guess my project is over before it begins. So I had to improvise, adapt, and overcome. So what I realized was to do a double exposure, I needed two entirely separate scenes. And then I had to compose those not just the composition of the images but the exposure of those images had to work together as well sometimes one exposure was two stops hot and the second was two stops under sometimes they were both neutral you had to learn i had to learn on the fly and i did so for two weeks that's what i did i learned how to do multiple exposures and I was happy with the 2019 trip. There's probably eight or 10 images that I thought, okay, these work as a little, a little story. And so when I went back this year to teach with Elena, instead of taking her workshop, we co-taught the classes together. I taught more of the bookmaking aspect, but I went back with an X-T4 instead of an X-T2. And the X-T4 shoots nine exposures on a, on a single frame. So I was like, oh, this is interesting. Now things get a little more, a little more spicy. This is like adding a little red chili to the top of the photograph. I was like, wow, this is interesting. And the same applies. Now the X-T4 has a, a multitude of options inside in terms of how you can stack those images based on exposure. And again, it's a language that you have to learn. I experimented a lot. Within the first two exposures of a multiple exposure, I know whether it's gonna work or not. And I either, if it is, I keep going. And if it's not, I start over. I just, I just you know, jump to the next, uh, first frame and start the process over again. I think so. <clears throat> and I'm going to mention this in the film. I think the film I shot 21, 24. So 2,124 images total in two weeks, three weeks. And remember a lot of those are images stacked up. So the grand total immediately I edited from 2,124 to 295. That took me about 10 minutes because it was just selecting all the final multiple exposures. Then I had done multiple exposures of every single one of the students in both classes, unbeknownst to them. So I would sort of follow them around and then I would do a multiple of them in a specific scene. And the scenes that worked the best were the shorelines in Saranda and also the old communist factories that were in some cases still operating. They just made the best multiple exposures and I would have one where each student walked away with their own multiple exposure. So I, I went from 295 down to, I want to say like 40 something. Then I called my edit, which was 19. And then within the 19, I think there were nine or 10 images total from the whole trip that I will save. I'll save everything, but 10 that will actually be discussed, shown, and could be part of something at some point. So let me, let me, just, let me just repeat that for those of you who are holding your breath right now. This is called editing. Editing from 2,124 to 1,000 images is not editing. That is a waste of time. Editing is saying or asking, what are the 10 best images from the entire trip? Rank them in importance and show me the single most important image that you made during your trip. That is called editing. So I went from 2124 to 295 to 49 to 19 to less than 10. That's where we're at. And those are all of those are doubles. Now, one thing I did in 2019 and in 2022 was I also tried to make single standalone images. I was much more successful at that in 2019 because I wasn't teaching. This year, I probably have maybe a grand total of four from three weeks, four images, and none of them are as good as the ones I shot in 2019. They're just not. I just I didn't have that time to focus on those. Multiple exposures are a gimmick. Don't let anyone fool you. Half the time you're shooting them and you're going, this is the dumbest thing I have ever done. And then the other half, you're like, that is a badass looking image. Is it? Is it? Or is it? A, it's a gimmick. 
straight images way harder, way, 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 way harder. And I'll tell you what, I was blown away by the students, their ability to make straight images. Nobody else on the trip except my wife who totally poached my technique without even batting an eye. My wife didn't even hesitate. She goes, first of all, here's what happens. My wife goes out and shoots her face off blows through every battery, drains every single battery she has. Somehow, I've never gone through a single battery on an X-T2 in an entire day. I've never done it. And those batteries are tiny and they suck. She blow, she melts all her batteries down by like two o'clock in the afternoon. She's got no batteries and she shot like 20 trillion images. And then she goes, hey, when are you going to edit my stuff? Literally, she's not even going to bother. It's, she's waiting for me to edit it. So I sit down to, after I've edited my stuff and edited the help with the students editing, I get like at middle of the night, I get to her work, double exposures. I go, what is this? She goes, yeah, I took your technique. I don't care. So she poached it big time, but the students, none of them shot multiple exposures. They made some really nice standalone images. Really nice. I was impressed and um, kind of freaked out. I was like, hey, wait a second. That's not fair. Okay. Number six, what elements make a great story and what is the best way to tell it so that it connects with the audience? I wrote a list. Have you seen this? It's the M3 Apple. No one has it yet except me. It's so light and fancy. You use it as a fan. They actually, no. This one gets so hot you could use it as a space heater and not have to burn the, uh, the generator. What makes a great story? Passion, emotion, information, heroism, failure, evil, good over evil, triumph, and surprise. That's what makes a good story. One or multiple of those elements. And there are probably more if I had given it more time. That's what you're after. You're after those things. Passion, information, telling, some, telling something to someone they don't know. Uh, good documentaries do that all the time. And also just a powerful emotion, surprise, anger, evil, good, bad, a drama, all that stuff. That's a good story. How you convey that should be filtered down to your DNA. It's just like your fingerprint. Your fingerprint and mine do not match. The way that you see the world and how I see it do not match. You have to figure out how you see the world. You cannot find it on YouTube. You cannot find it online. You will certainly not find it on Instagram. These are about conformity. These are about palatability. These are about phoniness to gain following or palatability. You will not find yourself on these platforms. You're certainly not gonna find it on my channel. So you have to work and figure it out how you tell stories and what makes your story different from mine. If we're both covering the same event, why does yours look the way it does? That's what you're after. <clears throat> okay. Number seven, can you feel a difference in yourself between your first and second trips to Albania? Any things you would have told your former self before going on the first trip? I sort of touched on this a minute ago, but there's one thing I did not touch on. My skills as a photographer are diminishing. Let me repeat that. This is probably not something you're going to hear a lot on YouTube where everybody's trying to win the popularity contest. He could be king of the winter carnival. What movie is that? It's a legendary flick, by the way. And Kent, we were gonna make you queen. No, we were gonna make you king of the winter carnival. Really? No. My skills as a photographer are diminishing. They're not getting better, they're getting worse. Because I'm not a photographer anymore. My job is not photography. What I do for Blurb they don't give me photo assignments. The work that I make is just, it's onesie, twosie things, whatever I can steal along the way. What I do for Blurb is I give a lot of talks. I have three or four this month that I'm prepping for right now. I do, um, consulting is not the right, the right term, but like I have a, a call this week with um, someone who developed one of our main pieces of software and they want me to talk about the software with them. We troubleshoot, we look at things, we look at the interface. This has nothing to do with photography. I do a ton of writing, nothing to do with photography. The images that I submit for those written pieces are most of the time things that I've pulled from my archive that are going back like 15, 20 years. It's rare that I'm using imagery that's new in any of those written posts. 
Historically for Blurb, I was on the road most of the time doing much of their educational outreach and also much of the public speaking associated with the company. So I'm doing talks and lectures and panels and symposiums and workshops and festivals. None of that has anything to do with photography. I used to shoot every day for years, I, decades. I shot every single day. My skills went like this. Now they're going like this, unfortunately, and it's frustrating. It's absolutely frustrating. I feel like um, a fighter who's in the, who's like had their chance at the title and lost it. And then now is just a punching bag for like, you know, younger kids on the rise. That's what it feels like. And so, you know, is it the end of the world? No. Do I get lucky every now and then? Sure. But unless I make drastic changes and start shooting all the time, it's not going to get better. So my expectation level in Albania on this trip for myself photographically was as low as you could get. My goal was to teach and also to just enjoy the fact that I'm in this place, which is in such transition right now. And to see Albanians learning and struggling and succeeding and expanding and, and really interfacing with this outside world is a wonderful thing to see. It's far more important than my photography. So what would I have told my former self? Enjoy it while you're here, that you're not, you're not having to do anything else in 2019. The only thing I had to do was shoot and write. That's it. It was a blast and record some sound. Okay. <clears throat> Question number eight, simple. Are you a vegetarian? No, I'm not a vegetarian. Uh, I probably could be, uh, if someone was cooking for me, I love vegetarian food. I tend to, when I eat what I, what I consider good vegetarian food, I always think to myself, if I had a chef, I would probably be vegetarian. And I don't have anything against people eating meat. If that's what you want to do, go ahead. I don't eat a lot of meat because my wife has been a pescatarian since 1976. And so we, you know, she's not going to eat red meat, chicken, pork, anything like that. She'll eat seafood from time to time, but that's about it. So we were joking with her uncle last night. He's very much a meat guy, but since we've been here, he, I don't, I think he's had meat one time and he was laughing because he's, he's 85. He's like, I don't miss it. Like, you know, this food that we're having and we're eating is good. So what's the, what's the deal? So no, I'm not vegetarian. Uh, number nine, question number nine, what is your favorite? What are your favorite blurb items? And give me some specifics. So this is a good question. Um, this is what I do most of my day is to help people navigate the blurb ecosystem or any other self pub ecosystem to help people get their work into print. <sighs> Suspiciously like smoke out somewhere, but it's maybe barbecue-y. I don't know, gotta keep an eye out. Anyway, um, favorite blurb items. Love magazine. Magazine is the sleeper cell of products. Why every photographer does not have their own magazine series is beyond me. Photographers will go take the long, long, long road up over the mountains to avoid doing anything like this. They will talk trash for years at a time and never do anything. Why on earth, if you are a working photographer, if you are out, or especially if you're a dock photographer, if you're a street photographer, whatever it is you're doing, why on earth for $6 you can make an eight and a half by 11 premium magazine to showcase your work. Why on earth would you not do that? So magazine I love, six by nine trade book. Trade books are a whole separate lineup inside of Blurb. You have photo book, magazine, trade book. Love magazine, go premium if you're using photography. With photo books, I like the eight by 10 portrait size the best. Um, even though I shoot mostly landscape or horizontal uh, aspect ratio, I love those vertical portrait books. I like the uh, uncoated ProLine paper, which is one of the more expensive papers. I also like the standard paper. I think the standard paper, which is the least expensive, looks really good. It's not as thick, not as durable, but who cares? It looks great. I also like lay flat for portfolios. And if you think that like 250 or 300 bucks for a book for a portfolio is expensive, then you don't remember what it was like back in the day trying to make a portfolio. That is not expensive and they look fantastic. I've done exactly one because I don't need portfolios anymore, but when I got it, I was very surprised how much I liked it and how good it looked. Six nine trade books, standard color paper. That is a wonderful little format. They are so inexpensive. They look great. These are not photo books, people. And by the way, before I lose my mind, when you're making books, whether it's with Blurb or any platform, you have got to test. You have to do test books. There is no way around it. 
I don't want to hear complaints. I don't want to hear this book better be perfect the first time out and no, I've never made a book and I still want it to be perfect. This is what I hear on a regular basis from photographers. It's crazy. What in the creative world is perfect on the first go? Does a novelist sit down and write his first draft and he's done? No. Do photographer photo essays, are they perfect on the first pass? No. Is a painting perfect? No. Everybody works through revision and bookmaking is exactly the same. So if you're working on a six by nine soft cover trade book, it is so inexpensive. Test, experiment, tinker. I don't know what paper is going to work best for you. I love the, the economy black and white paper in trade books, but does it work for color photography? No. How do I know that? Testing. Pretty simple. So those six by nine trade with standard color magazine and 810 portrait uh, photo book with uh, the uncoated proline stock. Uh, do you know any contemporary photographers still working in photojournalism? Why, yes, I do. And in fact, one of the people on this list, I'm going to reach out to and ask about doing a podcast with them, an interview. I think I'm going to do it for Blurb, actually. We are going to talk about is photojournalism dead? And what's it like to work full-time as a photojournalist today? And oh, by the way, this person just launched a book that's getting a lot of uh, a lot of talk right now. It's a very, very timely book. He's good. He's been good forever. And we also went to, we both did, went to the University of Texas photojournalism program. So I'm going to reach out. David Buto, Louis Palu, Ron Haviv, Michael Robinson Chavez, Lindsay Adario. There are many, 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 many photojournalists working today. That is just the tip of the iceberg. The best thing to do is to look at their agencies. And this way, when you go to their agency, you'll see 20, 30 photographers who are working in the same uh, photojournalism field. So agencies like Seven, and that's Roman numeral Seven, Magnum, VU, which is in France, VU, Rafo, R-A-P-H-O, I think they're still around. Panos, P-A-N-O-S, Contact Press Images, SIPA, and that's just a few. There are many more out there. These are photojournalism agencies. They have rosters of photographers that you can look at and see who is doing what where. And yes, thank God we have photojournalists out there because um, I don't know about you, but I actually still believe in what they are doing. When I see a Ron Haviv photograph from Ukraine, I don't think to myself, oh, that's manipulated. Oh, I don't trust that guy. No, he's been doing this for a long, long, long time. And manipulating for him, changing things and getting caught means end of a career. I still believe in good journalism. And I think the people who don't are scared. They are a bunch of babies who don't want to be confronted by the facts. And in America here, can't speak to the rest of the world. We've got about half our country who just wants no part of truth anymore. And we are about to suffer in a major, major way. It's beginning. It's smoldering, people. It's like the little little starter on my camp stove where I turn the gas on and I'm click, 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 click. That's where we are as a country right now. And all it's going to take is that spark. Let's hope it never comes. Last question. Uh, this is a hilarious one. And we're almost done here. Last question is, I'm just getting started. What do I do? That's hilarious. Whoever you sent, whoever sent that in, I love you. I think what this person meant is, I'm a young photographer and I'm starting out and I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing. And what am I supposed to do? Again, I find that hilarious. But that's okay. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to put your camera away you're gonna delete your social media accounts and you're not gonna go on the internet for at least two weeks. What you're gonna do is get a pen and a piece of paper and you're gonna sit down and you're gonna ask yourself, what is it you actually want from the world? What is it you want for your life? Number one. Number two is you're gonna write down what your most ingrained, powerful beliefs are. What do you actually believe in? Then you're gonna write down what those beliefs mean to you and how they make you feel. This is not easy. This is an incredibly difficult assignment. If you rip through this in five minutes, you're not doing it right. And chances are you're probably putting down answers that are from other people and not yourself. Most of the time when I ask people what is it they actually truly want to do in their life, if they had no strings attached, if money was not an issue, they could do any single thing they could possibly do for the rest of their life with no strings attached, rarely does anyone have an answer. 
And I have asked that to people who are very, very successful, who have been successful, they can't answer it. I've asked a lot of young people that, a lot of art school students, they can't answer it. For most of my adult life, I could have answered it very quickly. Now, not so much. So you can have these answers and you can lose them and you gotta work to get them back. This is the foundation for who you will be as a photographer. If you don't take the time to understand that foundation, you are playing a short play, short game. You will never make it. You will never survive in the long term. You have to have conviction about your work and about life and about your focus and your dedication and your drive. If you don't, if you're not con absolutely driven to do this, you will not make it. You can fake it and you can do YouTube for a living. You can fake it, do social media for a living. Again, short play. Everybody flames out. The algorithm crushes everybody. So if you're faking it, it catches up. That's why everybody that's on social, social media superstars, they all have mental health issues. They crash and burn. They get a nose ring. They grow their hair out. They go to India. They do ayahuasca. They come back as a guru. That's how it works now. That's the cycle of insanity that we find ourselves in now. Fake it, social, hit the peak, make some money, mental health, crash, nose ring, long hair, India, ayahuasca, guru. That's it. That's where we're at. This whole film can be summed up with that phrase. Thank God this is over. It's getting hot in here. It's musky. Musky. Anyway, I appreciate you sending in the questions. I'm one guy with one opinion. Take it for what it is. I'm living in a van. How successful could I possibly be? I'm wearing the same shirt I did on the film. And I'm telling you, you're just lucky you're not in the van with me right now because it is ripe in here. Anyway, again, all seriousness, I appreciate it. And uh, I will be back with some other cockamamie film.